Matthew Brown holds a BA degree in history from Brigham Young University. He's the author of eight books, and I happen to know they're very popular books, with two more forthcoming, which explores topics such as Joseph Smith, Ancient and Modern Temples, The Book of Mormon, Gifts of the Spirit, The First Vision, Prophecies, and The Plan of Salvation. Matthew has also had articles published in the Journal of the Book of Mormon Studies in the Farms Review. He has been invited on several occasions to lecture to the University of Utah LDS Institute faculty, and he will be a presenter in the 2008 Students of the Ancient Near East Symposium on Temples and the Ritual in Antiquity to be held on BYU campus. He has written several papers for the Foundation for Apologetic Information and Research and has been a speaker at two previous fair conferences. Please give a warm welcome for Matt Brown. The book of Exodus informs us that during the days of the prophet Moses, the Lord commanded the Israelites to build a portable temple called the Tabernacle. The Lord provided Moses with the design for this building, and he also indicated what kind of clothing would be worn by those persons who officiated there, and what type of ritual activities would take place within its precincts. This structure was notable for its connection with the initiation ceremonies of the Israelite priests. When the covenant people finally settled in their homeland, the Lord commanded that a larger permanent temple be built after the same pattern as the tabernacle. In this temple, the priests of Israel continued to be initiated into their office, but this was also a house wherein kings experienced ordinances that were connected with their enthronement. The temple institution continued to have a central place among the descendants of the patriarch Jacob up through the earthly sojourn of the Messiah and for several decades thereafter until the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in 70 AD. Christians who reject the idea that a temple has any relevance to the modern disciples of the Savior usually argue for the following two points. Number one, the atonement of Jesus Christ made Israelite temple worship obsolete. And number two, temple ceremonies were never part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In this paper, I would like to weigh these two claims in the balance against the historical and biblical records and see if they hold up. In the process of doing so, I will present what I believe to be a new and hopefully insightful approach to this issue. Critics have charged that the Israelite temple institution became obsolete for the contemporary followers of Jesus Christ. But the texts of the New Testament do not seem to support this contention. The Savior himself did not reject the temple shortly before his death on Calvary. He cleansed the temple in Jerusalem, indicating that he viewed it not only as his father's house, but also as a place that needed to retain its state of sanctity. In the book of Mark, chapter 14, verse 49, the Redeemer stated that he taught in the temple on a daily basis, and his disciples followed suit. According to the book of Acts, all that believed continued daily with one accord in the temple. In addition, the book of Acts indicates that Christ's apostles were commanded by an angel to teach in the temple and they obeyed this directive daily. It should be pointed out that the apostles of Jesus Christ did not leave the temple behind. They were forcibly removed from its premises. Peter and John were there during the hour of prayer and were kicked out by the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees. The apostle Paul was shown the door by a group of Jews from Asia. It should be noted that before Paul was taken away, he had submitted himself to rituals of purification, thus demonstrating that even a leader of the Christian faith had no aversion to participating in some of the Israelite temple ordinances. It should also be noted that in Acts 22, 17 through 18, Paul is described as offering prayer in the temple, and while doing so, he had a vision of the resurrected Lord there, and he received instructions from the Lord there about building up the Lord's kingdom. In all of this, it can be seen that the first century disciples of Jesus Christ attended the temple often, experienced purification rites there, prayed there, taught there, and received revelation from the resurrected Lord there. Notice that all of these things happened after the tearing of the temple veil, which occurred during the crucifixion. It is obvious that the destruction of that particular curtain did not signal to the first century Christians that the temple had become obsolete and should therefore be abandoned. 
Another argument made by critics is that since Moses built the tabernacle and the rituals of priestly initiation were practiced inside the tabernacle, they must have been classified as part of the law of Moses. Therefore, when the atonement abolished the law of Moses, the initiation rites of the priests became obsolete, or so the argument goes. But as anyone who reads the Old Testament should know, the office of priest, as recognized by God, predated the law of Moses, and so did the office of king. Melchizedek was both a king and a priest, and as indicated in Psalm 110 coronation text, the king of Israel was by divine decree a priest after the order, not of Aaron and the law of Moses, but of Melchizedek. Because the offices of king and priest existed prior to the law of Moses, there was no reason for their abolishment after the atonement had eliminated the old law. There is another New Testament text showing that there was a definite link between the first century Christians and the temple institution. This is the book of Revelation. In this scriptural record, the Apostle John described the heavenly temple of God in considerable detail, but this might not be obvious unless one looks at the big literary picture. Consider the parallels shown on this slide between objects described in the book of Revelation and the description of the tabernacle in the book of Exodus. When Moses was commanded to build the tabernacle on the earth, he was reminded to construct it according to the pattern that he had been shown by the Lord. It is evident from this directive and also the parallels on this slide that the heavenly temple of God served as the prototype for his earthly sanctuary. The first century Christians were not very likely to consider temple ideology to be obsolete since, as the Apostle John saw during his vision, God's throne was still located in his heavenly temple after the atonement had taken place. But beyond that, the text of Revelation chapter 6 verses 9 through 11 needs to be taken into consideration. There it is indicated that some people who once dwelt upon the earth had ascended to the heavenly temple and were invested there with white clothing. The message being that Christians, even after the atonement of Jesus Christ had taken place, could experience the rite of investiture in the temple of God. Critics are quick to point out that in Revelation chapter 21, verse 22, John said that he did not see a temple inside of the city of the heavenly New Jerusalem. And they conclude from this statement that the temple had become outdated in the eternal scheme of things. But what the critics have failed to recognize is the fact that while John declared that there will be no temple in the New Jerusalem, that city itself is, as it were, a vast sanctuary. This according to George Beasley Murray in his commentary on the book of Revelation. And beyond this, it needs to be recognized that the city was fashioned after the cubic pattern of the Holy of Holies of the earthly temple. Anyone who enters into this city will thus be entering into the most holy place of God's temple. We'll speak about that more in a minute. While all of the above information tends to support the idea that the first century Christians held to a positive outlook on temple ideology, the question naturally arises about whether or not those early Christians had a connection to the Israelite temple's initiation system. Again, the book of Revelation provides relevant information in this area. In chapter one of that apocalypse, the apostle John directs his comments to numerous individuals who constitute the seven churches which are in Asia, and mentions that Jesus Christ had made us kings and priests unto God. Then in chapter five of the same book, the 24 elders who surround God's throne, as pictured in this slide, declare that the lamb, meaning Jesus Christ, had made them kings and priests unto God. This same group of 24 elders, who likely represent the 24 courses of the temple priests of ancient Israel, are said elsewhere in John's book to be clothed in white raiment and having crowns of gold upon their heads. A glance through the books of the Old Testament confirms that the temple priests of ancient Israel and the Israelite kings wore white linen vestments and were adorned with golden crowns. But the question still remains about the nature of the Christian kingship and priesthood during this time period and how status in these offices was bestowed. Were they simply symbolic, spiritualized, and allegorical titles? Or did the New Testament saints physically experience initiation rites like the kings and priests did during the times of Moses and Solomon? I would like now to draw your attention to a distinct pattern in the book of Revelation, which suggests that the offices of king and priest were not simply bestowed upon the first century Christians by verbal decree. This pattern is found among 12 statements made by deity regarding those mortals who overcome the world. 
Let us briefly examine each of these 12 statements in the order of their appearance in John's Apocalypse and make comparisons between them and the initiation rites of ancient Israel's kings and priests. Notice also as we go through these slides, the number of connections between the promises enunciated by the Lord and the physical objects found inside of Israelite temples. Number one, eat of the tree of life in paradise. New Testament scholar David Ahn of Notre Dame University explains in his book of Revelation commentary that this is a promise that the godly and the righteous will inherit the Garden of Eden. Notice in the book of Revelation that the tree of life and the water of life are located inside of the New Jerusalem Holy of Holies cube. In addition, it is said in John's record that there will be no curse there and no more death or sorrow there. And the inhabitants of the New Jerusalem Holy of Holies will act as servants. Now what's particularly interesting about this is that these are all patterns that are associated with Adam and Eve's story in the book of Genesis. So we can make a comparison. The message in all of this is that people who are allowed access to the Holy of Holies city will become like Adam and Eve and experience some of the things that they did before the fall. There is also a connection between these ideas and the enthronement rites of the Israelite king. In the book of Genesis, it is stated that God created Adam and put him into the Garden of Eden. In Psalm 2, which is recognized by many biblical scholars as a coronation text, the Lord states that he has set the Israelite king upon the holy hill of Zion, or the Temple Mount. A book entitled Adam in Myth and History draws attention to this parallel and makes the connection between kingship and the Adam figure. This connection becomes more significant when it is remembered that the Israelite temple was decorated with symbols of the Garden of Eden. Slide number two, not hurt by the second death. The rabbinic expression second death describes the type of death that will be suffered by the wicked in Sheol. Revelation chapter 20 verse 6 clarifies that kings and priests of God will not be affected by the second death. Professor Gregory Beale of Wheaton College has written in a New International Greek Testament commentary that it is the priestly and kingly status of persons that gives them power over the second death because such people will be able to serve in the presence of God. The idea of serving in God's presence is significant to this discussion because Revelation chapter 22 reveals that God will be physically present inside of the New Jerusalem Holy of Holies. But it also says that those people who qualify for the second death cannot enter into the gates of the New Jerusalem Holy of Holies. Or in other words, they will not be able to pass by the angels who stand guard at the gates of that structure, as can be seen by reading Revelation chapter 21 verse 12. This circumstance was mirrored by the cherubim which were embroidered upon the temple veil that was stationed at the entrance to the Holy of Holies of the earthly temple, and also by the priestly porters who stood at the temple entrances. Some Old Testament scholars are of the opinion that in order for someone to get past the temple porters, they had to participate in an entrance liturgy where questions and answers were exchanged and a password was given. This brings us to the picture of the bells on this slide. This, these devices were attached to the bottom of the robe that was given to the high priest of the temple when he received his initiation rites. You will notice in the scriptures listed below these bells that they were necessary for the high priest to have on his person so that he would not suffer death when he went within the veil. In Richard Watson's Biblical and Theological Dictionary, he tells us that the palace of kings was not to be entered without due notice. And this was done by striking some sonorous or sound-producing object. The high priest did, by the sound of his bells at the bottom of his robe, says this commentator, ask leave to enter into the sanctuary of God. On this next slide, you can see by the quotations on the left that both kings and priests of Israel went through a washing rite as part of their induction into office. At the bottom of this slide is a passage from the book of Exodus wherein the Lord states that his temple priests were required to ritually wash certain parts of their bodies with water before serving inside of his holy house. Failure to do so could result in the offender suffering death. Number three, eat of the hidden manna. It is known from the text of both the Old and New Testaments that a portion of the manna that fed the Israelites during Moses' day was concealed inside of the Ark of the Covenant, which was itself placed inside of the Holy of Holies. Because of the inaccessibility of this manna, except to the high priest of the temple, 
It could be thought of as being hidden away. There was a Jewish tradition that during the Messianic era, the manna, or bread as Moses called it, would once again descend and nourish God's covenant people. During Jesus Christ's Messianic, messianic ministry, he positively identified himself, of course, as the bread of life. George Woodengren, in his study called The King of the Tree of Life in the Ancient Near Eastern Religion, hypothesized from his knowledge of Mesopotamian cultic patterns that the pot of manna in the Israelite temple was part of the regalia handed over to the king of Israel during his coronation ceremony. While there is no reference to manna in the coronation psalms, there is a comparable reference to nourishment in Psalm 110, verse 7, where it is said that the king will drink of the brook. This is likely the Gihon brick, which was considered mythologically to be the source of life. This act of drinking could thus be seen as partaking of the water of life, which is something that those in the New Jerusalem Holy of Holies are positively said that they will do. Number four, receive a new name. The new name is a subject that is directly connected with royal accession. When the Israelite king is crowned and receives the scepter, says the Anchor, Anchor Bible Dictionary, he receives a new name. An article published in the Journal of Biblical Literature says, quote, the indications are that the bestowal of a regnal name or throne name was a regular feature of the pattern of kingship in Judah from the time of David down to the time of Zedekiah, end quote. This source also states that the occasion of the bestowal of the royal name was doubtless the time of the anointing and enthronement. The utterance of the new name would naturally accompany the divine adoption, a subject that we'll talk about later on. On this slide, you can see an illustration of the story in Genesis where the patriarch Jacob wrestles with the so-called angel. Yet in this sculpture, which is from Salisbury Cathedral Complex, the two seem to be embracing rather than wrestling. Indeed, one medieval rabbi's commentary, and I will not attempt to pronounce his name, he has a commentary on the Torah, and he insists that Jacob's experience with a heavenly being should be translated as, and he embraced him. The book of Genesis says that it was in this embrace that Jacob received a new name. In Lewis Ginsburg's collection on the legends of the Jews, it is reported that the two cherubim on top of the Ark of the Covenant were both male in gender. And they would miraculously embrace each other whenever Israel was devoted to their Lord. And embrace was thus associated with the Holy of Holies of the Israelite Temple. As Dr. Raphael Patai has noted in one of his published volumes, the cherubim were at one time refashioned as a male and a female couple and were shown in an intimate embrace. But the meaning of the imagery associated with them remained the same as before. They were quote, a symbolic expression of the relationship between God and Israel, end quote. As an aside, it might be mentioned that early Christian initiation embraces were reported between 150 and 450 AD by Hippolytus, Cyril, Ambrose, Chrysostom, and Narsai. Number five, power over the nations. This is a passage that has direct connection to royal coronation texts of the Old Testament. These verses in the book of Revelation are, in fact, a free rendering of Psalm 2, 8, and 9. This becomes clear when you see them side by side as on this slide. Here, recognized kingship coronation motifs are being applied directly to the first century followers of Jesus Christ. Number six, reception of the morning star. The morning star is actually not a star at all, but rather the planet Venus. During Babylonian times, Venus was the symbol of sovereignty. In Roman times, it was more specifically the symbol of victory and sovereignty. It therefore appears in connection with what was discussed in the previous slide, that the morning star was a sign of conquest and rule over the nations. And of course, in Revelation 22, 16, Jesus Christ calls himself the morning star. The second scriptural reference on this slide, down at the bottom, shows that in the Septuagint version of Psalm 110, verse three, which is a royal coronation text, the morning star is mentioned. In the King James translation of this verse, however, only the concept of mourning is discernible. Number seven, clothed in white raiment. According to Robert Thomason's commentary on the New Testament apocalypse, the source of this image is Zechariah 3, 1 through 10, where the filthy garments of Joshua, the high priest of the temple, are replaced with clean ones. He says that overcomers are thus linked to the priesthood and priestly functions through this promise in the book of Revelation. It is well known that the temple priests of ancient Israel were invested with white clothing when they were initiated into office. 
But it appears from 1 Chronicles 15.27 that the king of Israel also received clothing of this nature. And it seems from a modern scholarly rendition of Psalm 110 that the king's acquisition of this apparel took place on the day of his enthronement. William Brown of the Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, translates verse 3 of this recognized text as saying, in holy splendor. And he notes that the feminine cognate of the word splendor can refer to cultic vestments. Indeed, one modern Bible translates these words as in holy garments, and another says, you will wear the sacred robes. Number eight, name not blotted from the book of life. One commentator on this passage says that the book of life is frequently referred to in ancient Israelite and Jewish literature as a kind of heavenly citizen registry. In addition, he teaches that in Judaism and early Christianity, the primary setting of the Book of Life motif was the judgment scene in which God is seated upon his throne surrounded by heavenly courtiers. The origin of this metaphor, he says, is certainly that of the ancient Near Eastern royal court, where records were made available to the king for dispensing justice. Another tie into this promise with Israelite kingship can be discerned in Psalm 72, another recognized coronation text. In verse 17, it is stated that the king's name will endure forever, which is another way of saying that it will not be blotted out. Number nine, made a pillar in the temple. This is a reference to the heavenly temple, says one scholar, and to the individual becoming, quote, a permanent part of the temple of God and hence a continual participant in the divine worship that takes place there, end quote. Robert Charles, a fellow of the British Academy, thought it possible that this figurative language served to set forth the dignity of the faithful as priests of God in the next world. In this light, is it interesting to note that in the Psalm 110 coronation document, it is stated that the king is going to be a priest forever. Number 10, name of God in New Jerusalem. This promise can be directly connected to the temple priests since Revelation chapter 22 verse 4 indicates that the name of God is written on the forehead of the individual and Exodus 39.30 specifies that the name of God was written on the crown or forehead of the high priest of the temple. In this way, all of those who overcome the world become or are designated as high priests and would thus all have access to the Holy of Holies of the temple, a concept which is confirmed in Hebrews 9.3 and 10.19. The name of God and the name of his city should not be overlooked, says Richard Wilkinson in the Journal of Biblical Literature. The relationship between the Oriental king and his city was of the greatest significance, as the city symbolized the institution of kingship, not only by virtue of his position as the seat of the monarchy, but also because of the very act of accession was invariably legitimized by the site of the enthronement. If we turn to Psalm 89, which is another kingship coronation text, we can see a possible parallel to this concept in verse 34, excuse me, 24. There the king of Israel is promised that he will be exalted in the Lord's name. Number 11, seated upon Christ's throne. The Savior's throne as mentioned in this promise is the throne of David or the throne of the Israelite king. This promise suggests that the idea of deification for the saint who is privileged to take this exalted chair. The promise that the victorious Christian will sit with Christ on his throne, says one commentator, is based on ancient Near East and Israelite kingship and enthronement imagery. The phrase, just as I also conquered and sat with my father on his throne, says David On of Notre Dame, is an allusion to Psalm 110, verse 1. And of course, this mentions the footstool of the usual like king's throne. The Psalm 89 coronation text speaks of God establishing the king's throne at the time of coronation, but a more direct parallel to this promise of Revelation 3.21 can be seen in the two books of Chronicles, where it is stated that Solomon sat upon the throne of the Lord as king meaning that he was a vice regent and representative of the heavenly sovereign. Number 12, adoption and inheritance. The connection of Revelation 21.7 text with Israelite kingship becomes clear when it is compared alongside Psalm 2 verses 7 through 8. The divine adoption formula is present in both passages, and this in turn is tied to the concept of all-encompassing inheritance. Roland DeVoe affirms in his volume on ancient Israel that the king was adopted by deity on the day of his consecration. The Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament states that the sonship of the king is considered to be a divine guarantee of his power and authority. It is divine power that gives the king his power. 
The illustration on this slide is the patriarch Jacob adopting Ephraim and Manasseh and assigning Ephraim as the inheritor of the blessings of the firstborn. Psalm 89, 29, coronation text, indicates that the king of Israel becomes the Lord's firstborn. Here on this slide, which I'll just let you take a look at, it's the same slide that I showed before, except for this time it shows the connections between those kingship and priesthood initiation rites. You can see that there's some very distinct connections. But the question that still needs to be asked at this point is, did the early Christians view this connection with ancient temple initiation rites as merely allegorical, or is there any evidence that a connection took place in liturgical form? The most logical thing to do to resolve this question is to take a look at the early Christian liturgical practices and see if there is a connection with the initiation ceremonies of the Israelite kings and priests. But before we take that journey, I would like to point out that the long-standing view of many scholars has been that the early Christian liturgy was a development of activities that took place inside of the Jewish synagogue. That view has not gone unchallenged, however. In Margaret Barker's book called The Great High Priest, The Temple Roots of Christian Liturgy, she, points forward, she puts forward her belief that it is more likely that the early Christian worship was modeled on that of the angel priests in the heavenly temple than derived from the synagogue. And she has a similar longer quote in her book called Temple Themes in Christian Worship. With this view enunciated, we can now turn to a larger collection of early Christian initiation texts that was updated in 2003 by Dr. Maxwell Johnson of Notre Dame. This collection is called Documents of the Baptismal Liturgy. Throughout these texts are references to temple terms, such as laver, altar, sacrifice, incense, priest, Levite, high priest. There are even statements in these documents that initiates are going to enter into the temple of God to receive certain ordinances and also enter into the Holy of Holies. And in this respect, I would point you towards the Liturgy of Jerusalem, which is sometimes associated with James, the brother of the Lord, who was an apostle. This is about 350 AD, and it uses these terms temple and holy of holies to describe the building where the liturgy takes place. It should also be pointed out that like the promise from the book of Revelation, some of the early Christians were told that they would enter paradise by passing the cherubim who guard its entrance. They were also, in some instances, directly compared with Adam in paradise. Their names were said to be written in the book of life, and they participated in a form of adoption. Significantly, the themes of priesthood and kingship were taught to the initiates on a regular basis in these initiation documents. One text reads, as of old, priests and kings were anointed in Israel, so do you likewise. Let us take a closer look at the anointing ceremony of the Christian initiates and the temple connections that it had. On this slide, you can see the depiction of a kingly anointing in ancient Israel, and on the right are characteristics of the early Christian anointing ceremony. The numbers after each of the notations on this slide are pages from the book cited, or edited by Maxwell Johnson. Notice as we read through them that all of these concepts are matched by biblical texts that have to do with the anointing of the Israelite kings and priests. The initiate is brought to the holy temple of the Lord, to receive the anointing. The anointing is done with olive oil. The olive oil is fine and scented. The olive oil is consecrated. A container in the shape of a horn holds the oil. The priest pours out a sufficient quantity of the oil into the palm of his hand and anoints the initiate's body completely head downwards. There is an ancient Armenian text that describes the Christian anointing ceremony as it was practiced in that part of the world in the ninth century. I will just not read the whole thing, but I will tell you that the parts of the body that they are anointing are the forehead, the eyes, the ears, the nostrils, the mouth, the hands, the heart, the backbone, and the feet. Another obvious parallel between the initiation rites of the Israelites and the Christians was that of investiture. On this slide, you can see that in the background, someone is holding the white garment the initiate is about to receive. The color, of course, is matched to the white vestments worn by the Israelite kings and priests. In one early Christian text in Maxwell Johnson's book, this piece of baptismal clothing is specifically called the glorious robe which Adam lost. In another document, the initiates not only receive white vestments, but also a royal head covering, which is called a crown, and is bound upon them by a priest. 
These initiates are said to be wearing the garments of glory, which sounds very much like the garments for glory, which are given to the Israelite temple priests. And you can read that reference in Exodus 28. But the parallels between the clothing of the Israelite priests and the Christians do not end here. The ephod worn by the Israelite kings and priests has been identified in a book published by E.J. Brill as a ceremonial loincloth girded about the waist. The ephod worn by the high priest of the temple, says this text, was a sort of apron hung on the front of the body of the priest and fastened around the waist by means of an attached belt. It was made of fine linen cloth which was embroidered with colored threads. The evidence for aprons among the ecclesiastical dress of the early Christians is both literary and archaeological. The Creek clerics made note of the ritual aprons of the monks of Egypt, which were only worn by them on liturgical occasions. All of the buried monks at the monastery of St. Mark in Thebes had, quote, a leather apron deposited upon the last layer of clothing, end quote. Likewise, when the 7th century monks of the Epiphanios monastery were buried, their leather belts and leather aprons were tied about their waists on the outside of a layer of linen cloth. I have spoken with a person who is involved with the dig going on in Egypt of a Christian cemetery, and he has informed me that there are many, many people who have been taken out of the ground wearing aprons. And this cemetery is mentioned in a published article in BYU Studies, and this leads us to this next slide. Here are pictures of two of the other items of clothing worn by some of the early Christians in that cemetery. On the left is a robe that has linen strips gathered together in a knot on one of the shoulders, which may indicate that it is a priestly piece of clothing. Some of the robes worn by these Christians have the knot located on the left shoulder, while others have it on the right shoulder. The photograph on the right shows a garment worn next to the body of the Christian who was buried in it. What is curious about this piece of clothing is that it was decorated with rosettes over each breast and over the right knee, but not over the left knee. Then there's the hemmed cut across the abdomen. This feature is significant because a straight line design is sometimes depicted in artistic representations of early Christian white garments. Here are some examples. These marks are referred to overall as gamadia. The name comes from the Greek letter gamma, which is shaped like a right angle. You can see the right angle marks in both of these examples on the screen. The gamma or right angle mark is by far the most common of the gamadia to be found in early representations of the white Christian garment. The meaning of these marks is not clearly understood by scholars, but Edmondo Lupieri, an Italian professor of the history of Christianity, has recently postulated in a commentary on the book of Revelation that they may be connected with the kingship of Jesus Christ. If you examine early depictions of the Savior enthroned, you will notice that sometimes he has gamma marks on his robe, and so do the angels who stand next to his throne. It should be noted that right angle marks have been discovered on the tunics of some Coptic Christians, as shown here at the bottom of this slide. You can see that the same exact design on the tunic, a gamma mark with an interior square, is depicted on the veil above it. The veil in this mosaic represents the barrier of Eastern Christian churches, which separated the main audience chamber from what they called the Holy of Holies. These markings on the veil are interesting because it is known that they were that there were cosmological markings on the exterior veil of the Temple of Jerusalem during the time of Jesus Christ. We will talk about another cosmological symbol associated with the Savior in just a few minutes. On this slide, you see a modern-day replica of a Byzantine veil of a Holy of Holies with gamma marks on it. Besides what you can see here, there are also doors, veils, and gamma marks on either side of this doorway. The Byzantine church holding where these, this barrier is located is in Greece, and it is interesting to note that on its outer wall are symbols associated with the Temple of King Solomon. Even though scholars do not currently understand the meaning behind the gamma marks, the same shape was depicted in a medieval moralized Bible where the context is clear. Here on this slide, you can see Zacharias, the temple priest, and his wife, Elizabeth. She is holding a carpenter square to her chest and it's pointed off to her right, while he holds an architect's compass to his chest. 
A similar picture in another moralized Bible shows the same couple. Both of them are holding carpenter squares, and the accompanying text states that the right-angled tool is a symbol of their righteousness. The architect's compass is significant because it was displayed in many early Christian depictions of the Lord as the Creator. And interestingly, this image seems to have a connection with the kingship initiation rites of ancient Israel. Here on this slide, we see the Lord enthroned as king, and he holds a large compass over the elements of creation. Notice the waves of the sea on the outside edge of the world which he is holding. In Israelite cosmology, God was viewed not only as a king, but it was considered that his royal status was connected with his defeat of the chaos monster at the time of creation. The chaos monster was an insolent serpent who dwelt in the sea. And as Hermann Gunkel put it in his study on creation and chaos, he was God's antagonistic enemy whose dominion on earth was a reign of terror which perpetuated eternal devastation. On this slide, you see a reference to Proverbs chapter 8, where it is indicated that God conquered the chaos monster by inscribing a circle around the sea and thereby setting a boundary for the waves, which were a visible, a visible symbol of chaos. By turning to the Psalm 89 coronation text, we find creation motifs and also hear the Lord say to the king of Israel, I will set his hand also on the sea. According to Professor Nicholas White of the University of Edinburgh, Psalm chapter, Psalm chapter 89, verse 25, seems to speak of the Israelite king sharing with the heavenly king in the primeval victory over chaos. We may even conjecture, he said, that in an appropriate ritual, the king of Israel was handed the weapons of God at this juncture in the liturgy. But since the implication of Proverbs 8.27 is that the Lord overcame chaos by inscribing a circular boundary, it is just as logical to conclude that during the Israelite king's enthronement, he was handed not a weapon, but rather the instrument that the Lord is implied using, the architect's compass. If we scan through Maxwell Johnson's book on the documents of the baptismal liturgy, we find that when some of the early Christians received their initiation rites, they were not only taught the story of creation, but they had a confrontation with a serpent called Satan. The initiates were told that they were to consider the adversary to be in their immediate presence and to tell him to leave. Thus, a victory was symbolically gained against their adversary. Another way that the early Christians ritualistically separated themselves from Satan during their initiation rites was to renounce him by way of covenant. One initiation text is particularly interesting because in it, the initiates made their renunciation and covenant by clasping the left hand of the officiating priest. Then another covenant was made, this time to commit oneself to Jesus Christ by clasping the right hand of the officiator. The right-handed clasp is a motif found in early Christian artworks such as those on this slide in a context that has already been mentioned in this presentation. Here you see on the left that a monk is being admitted through the gate of paradise by the Apostle Peter. In the middle is the resurrected Christian in a white robe being admitted through the gate of New Jerusalem. And on the right we see the Israelite king standing at the veiled entrance of the Jerusalem temple and being admitted by the Lord into an assembly of people. Notice in the first and third pictures that a stairway is present, which visually designates both scenes as ascensions. It is curious that in the King James translation of Psalm 89 coronation text, it is said that the Lord's right hand will be established with the king. Psalm scholar John Eaton renders this passage with these words, with the Lord speaking, My hand shall hold him fast. This suggests a hand clasp between the heavenly king and his earthly vice regent. Indeed, two scholars who have written commentaries on the Psalms, Hans Krauss and Arnold Anderson, state that a right-handed clasp between God and the king belongs to the imagery of the Israelite enthronement ritual. In this last section of my presentation, I would like to bring you into the modern age and read some material from the Eastern Orthodox Christians. Now that you have seen the pattern set forth in this talk, you can decide whether or not temple architectural and liturgical motifs have been continued among the modern disciples of Jesus Christ. The architecture of Eastern Christian church buildings is symbolic in nature, reflecting the axis of space and also the axis of time. The axis of time begins with the creation and moves through the events of the Savior's life. 
Participants in the Syrian liturgy are considered to be personal participants in the events of sacred time. Beyond the entrance of the church, there is an open air forecourt. And let me just point out that if you take that open air forecourt and you put it down there at the bottom of that page, you will see that this is a very close replica for Solomon's temple. Beyond the entrance, we have the open-air forecourt where the shoes of the worshipers are removed. The interior of the church proper includes a main congregation hall called the nave. This area of the church represents the earth, and the easternmost portion of it, or the vestibule, represents the Garden of Eden. When scriptures are being read from this location during the liturgy, the readers are considered to be angelic messengers who bring God's teachings from heaven to earth. In earlier times, there were separate entrances into the nave for men and women, and each group would gather in their respective places in the main audience hall, males on the right and females on the left. The most important part of this church is located in the east and is called the choir or the Holy of Holies. This place represents heaven. An altar is placed inside of this area of the church, and above it is a baldachin, which is a symbolic of the Ark of the Covenant. The Holy of Holies and the nave in some Eastern churches is a barrier called the iconostasis. This screen is equipped with a doorway and a curtain is stretched across it. In Syrian Orthodox churches, only a curtain is utilized to mark this division. When the curtain is closed, it represents the breaking of the connection between heaven and earth because of the actions of Adam and Eve. Only certain ranks of clergy are allowed to pass by the curtain divider and into the Holy of Holies. The priest leads the prayers of the congregation from the altar inside the most holy place, and incense is employed during the liturgy to symbolically represent rising prayers. Notice in all of this that there are three ascending levels of existence represented in this building structure. There you have the nave, which is the earth. You have the vestibule, which is the Garden of Eden, which was considered to be a bridge. And then you have the choir or the Holy of Holies, three ascending degrees. Finally, let me read you a short summary of the initiation rites of Greek Orthodox monks from a book published by Yale University Press. See if you can detect any connections between what is said here and the information that has already been presented. Stage one, the initiate is brought into the church building and given a new name and is invested with a tunic and a headdress. Stage two, the service is symbolic of three things, a second baptism or washing, the return of the prodigal son, and marriage. The initiate goes to the royal doors in the altar, which is the iconostasis veil area, where the abbot, who represents the father from the prodigal son parable, meets him. There is an exchange of questions and answers between them, which begins with the abbot inquiring why the initiate has come there, and the initiate responds by announcing his intent. The questions and answers that follow incorporate the taking of formal vows of obedience, chastity, and living a monastic lifestyle. The abbot reminds the initiate that angels are present to record his activities. The initiate is then invested with ecclesiastical clothing, including a girdle and a headdress. At the end of the ceremony, the initiate and the initiator embrace each other. Stage three, the initiate is invested with the great schema, or the full religious clothing of the monk, which includes an elaborately embroidered apron. You can see that on the left, this apron includes a symbol of Adam and also the acronym for paradise. The clothing given to the initiate in this stage of his progression is never to be taken off day or night, even in death. Monks at this stage of initiation also vow, in addition, to renounce the world and the things of the world. Conclusion. This talk began by stating the claims of some individuals that the atonement of Jesus Christ made Israelite temple worship obsolete and temple ceremonies were never part of the gospel of the Redeemer. The evidence presented today calls these claims into question. Even after the atonement took place, those people who personally knew the Savior still held on to a distinct temple ideology. But more than that, they were promised by the Lord himself after the atonement had taken place that the faithful could receive temple-related blessings that were experienced by the kings and the priests of Israel. Liturgical practices of the Israelite temple found expression in some of the rites of the early Christians, and some of those practices are echoed among the orthodox followers of the Lord even today. Thank you for your attention.
When is the ancient Near Eastern Symposium at BYU where you're speaking? November the 7th. You should go. It's, <clears throat> I'm actually quite excited about it. It's going to be covering lots of different cultures and temple rituals within those cultures. And there's going to be uh, several BYU uh, professors speaking there, John Gee, Bill Hamlin, David Seeley, and um, a lot of students and monkey boy, that would be me. But <clears throat> uh, find information, you can talk to this uh, Brother McClellan if he's here. Track him down and he can tell you all about it. Well, I can't answer that one here, sorry. <clears throat> In your opinion, what is the symbolism behind the horn-shaped container of oil? Uh, that would be a symbol of kingly power. If you run up against an animal with horns, you might want to run the other way because they will grab you with those horns and they will move you. In fact, that's some of the symbolism that's used when you're talking about Ephraim's uh, patriarchal blessing. He's gonna have the ability to use his horns to push together the people, to gather them. And so what do you have uh, there in um, the Temple of Solomon? You've got the Brazen Sea, it's got 12 oxen around it, they've all got horns, but where are they facing? They're facing in the four different directions of the compass. So there you've got another question about Let's see. Any idea why leather was used for the aprons? Uh, the best thing that I have ever run into is the idea of, there's a scripture in the New Testament that says you've got prophets running around in sheepskins and goatskins. Well, guess what kind of leather they made those aprons out of in early Christianity? Sheepskins and goatskins. Which brings another thing to mind that I did not put into the talk. There's so much I did not put into the talk. In fact, I edited out a bunch of it just a few hours ago. But there is this idea that um, in uh, this one uh, community of monks, very early monks uh, in the ancient Near East, they were uh, wearing these pieces of leather and the wool was still on them. But when they took them off, they were very, very conspicuous, these, these uh, monks were, because they were all dressed in white linen. And of course, the white linen is the uh, type of material that is used for the clothing of the temple priests. Oh, boy, I wish I could answer that question, but this is not the right venue. In your opinion, let's see. I think that's pretty much gonna, is there any other questions that wanted to be brought up? One question came up. Go ahead. When's your book coming out on this? Which one? Oh. Uh, I have been asked to uh, produce some things, and I have produced them, and then they asked me to make them bigger. Um, some of you are aware that Dan Brown is going to come up with a book, and it's going to deal with Solomon's Temple. And uh, I've been asked to deal with that issue on several different levels. And uh, so that's in progress. I just barely finished the first vision book, 300 pages took four months to source check. So I just am getting out of that and next I'm going on to the symposium. And I really would encourage you to support that symposium. There's going to be some very fine speakers there and some extremely bright students. And they have some very important things to say about temples in other cultures. And so as Latter-day Saints, I think it's very important for us to understand those kinds of things uh, and read your scriptures and learn about the temple that is there in the Old Testament and also the temple ideology that's there in the New Testament. Testament, it will help you as a Latter-day Saint. Thank you.